I quote, he's a ram in this moment, unquote. In this moment, this moment. not exactly a <laughs> ringing endorsement. Wilbon, there are a lot of quarterbacks in motion in this moment. How should Goff feel about his future with the Rams? You know, I, he, you can't hear in this moment and think that they're ready to put you on the walk of fame. You, 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 can't, you can't make that presumption. So he's going to play somewhere. He's going to start somewhere. Maybe he'll go someplace where he needs a, a, a restart, you know. And I, I don't think this is a bad thing for golf. I mean, it hasn't worked since the Super Bowl. Golf has led the NFL, I believe, in turnovers since leading his team to the Super Bowl. So, it, I, you know, the marriage doesn't seem to be all that great. So maybe golf quietly is just saying, you know, fine, I can go somewhere else too. 39 turnovers in the last two years. He's obviously regressed as a quarterback. Mm -hmm. I feel so fortunate today because on my podcast this morning, I had Jason Lock and Four of CBS Sports. And we were talking about all these quarterbacks that are in motion. Some would move, some might not move. Here's what he said about Goff. He said, quote, everyone in the league knows John Wolford beat out Jared Goff, took his job. The Rams felt Wolford gave him a better chance to win. So Goff is gone, and with him, the $110 million guarantee that the Rams Oof. paid. Now, if I'm, if I'm the GM, Les Snead, and my last two big deals were Goff, and Todd Gurley, who's also gone, I might wonder if I've got my job in this moment because it doesn't look like he's done a particularly good job. So, yeah, so Goff moves on. Do you, you remember, it's just a couple of years ago when Sean McVay was an offensive genius because of what he did with Jared Goff, who had two really good years. Then they scored, Mike, three points in the Super Bowl. <coughs> and since then, when you talk about the Rams, all you talk about is defense. So, I mean, it, you know, being a genius is fleeting sometimes. Well, Tony, but here's the other thing. The Rams love making these big deals historically. I mean, you, you know, they, they, this is what they do. They sign people late. They make big deals. They like big splashes. It was the Rams that got Joe Namath at the end of his career. That's right. It's the Rams That's that right. traded Eric Dickerson. The, the Rams are always, historically, in, no matter who the owner is, involved in these big wow deals like they're a baseball team. So, Tony, this is just part of that franchise's culture to me that they would say, okay, ready for a new quarterback. Let's train our eyes on, wait for it, wait for it, Rodgers. Let me just tell you this for a second. This means that the last two NFC teams to make the Super Bowl, the Rams and the 49ers, are thinking of getting rid of their quarterbacks. Yeah. Is that, is that not amazing? Really? Young quarterbacks get rid of them? Wow. Wow. We've also got anonymous sources, Tom, weighing in on the state of the relationship between Rodgers and the Packers. Jason Lockenfora of CBS Sports says a rival head coach told him things have never really been that good between Rodgers and his head coach, Matt LaFleur. An assistant coach added, it's been the worst kept secret in football. And an NFL exec chimes in, quote, that thing is going to go nuclear. Trust me, the quarterback wants out. Close quote. Tone, do these comments feel like accurate analyses? or more like somebody's wishful thinking? Well, we've, we've now had uh, Jason Locke and Forum mentions, this is the third one in the first five minutes, that makes me happy. I was talking to him about Rodgers today, and what he said about Rodgers was, and it's another quote, what Rodgers has done is tell every team in the league, come get me, okay? Now, we haven't heard it from Rodgers, because Rodgers doesn't like to answer questions directly. Rodgers likes to speak in code, and we both like him a lot, but he's got a PhD in passive aggression. And he's always saying, oh, you guys in the media, you're making something out of nothing. And yet he's, he's doing this and this at the same time. Because <laughs> that's Aaron Rodgers. I can add one and one. And I'll say this again. One was they drafted Jordan Love and moved up to get him. And the plus one was Matt LaFleur taking the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands in the most critical play, you know, in, in the playoff game. So I said on this show the other day, I think he's taken his last snap because that's irreparable. I still think it's irreparable. They've publicly embarrassed the MVP of the league. I don't know how that goes forward. I well, don't. Well, Tony, listen, there are people on both sides of this, very smart people, who take the other side. Mark Murphy, we talked that's about right. yesterday, former president of the Packers, who has said he doesn't believe this at all. You know, I was on Get Up yesterday, and Jeff Saturday, who knows a little bit about great quarterbacks, says, wait a minute, they can't let him go? 
anywhere. And you, you listen to voices of reason like that. You go, OK, maybe Rogers will sit down at the table and they'll or they'll have a virtual Zoom lunch. He and Matt LaFleur and they'll figure out how to do this thing. And that's certainly possible. However, to quote my dear friend Stephen A. Smith, I don't see it that way. All the things Aaron Rodgers said leading up to the game about this beautiful mystery. I mean, that was before the game. Then he is insulted by said head coach, Matt LaFleur, who wants to kick a field goal and move down and score another touchdown right. when he doesn't even want to try right. to take a crack at scoring that touchdown. And I see that and I look at Rodgers' demeanor after the game and I'm thinking, I'm sorry. I don't see this working. And the Jordan Love, I mean, all the breadcrumbs, Tony, I'm following the same yeah. ones you are. Maybe yeah. they can patch it up one more time. But if you're going to be a free agent in 22 anyway, why not get out in 21, right, and get a year head start one more year on being in California somewhere? Here's what I would tell you. If I could ask Aaron Rodgers any single question, it wouldn't even be about where's he going to be next year. It would be this. Why didn't you run on third down? Yeah. Why didn't you run? I agree with that. Because that changes the arc of the game completely if you run on third down, right? Yes. Thus, we move now to an attractive matchup tonight. The Lakers, who are 10-0 on the road, are in Philadelphia to play the Sixers, who have the best record in the East right now. Daryl Morey, who's been running the Sixers for, I don't know, five or six weeks, told Stephen A. Smith of ESPN, and I quote, I think we are championship or bust, unquote. Wilbon, are the Sixers showing you signs that this is their year? Yeah, yeah, they're showing me signs that they can play right now. You got Embiid. He's certainly in top seven or eight form right now after a few others. But he, it, this, Embiid's having his best season, all right? Ben Simmons is not having his best season yet, but he's on the way there. Ben Simmons not having his best season. still like 13, 8, and 8. Now, if you convince me those guys are fine playing together, and here's why I'm going to disagree with my dear friend Daryl Morey. I would say, wait a minute. The Philadelphia 76ers, have a, has a, they have a GM who is great at tinkering, who is great at pre-deadline deals to help a team, who is great at off-season deals, even when the team is capped out to, 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 to make a deal and improve the team. Daryl Morey does that. He can do it next year. I don't believe this year is win or bust. They got a couple of years. Even Brooklyn's got a couple of years. I don't see any of the serious contenders being in a win or bust juncture, Tony. Do you? Well, I mean, I want to congratulate your Northwestern boo, Daryl Morey, for doing this to Doc Rivers, for saying to Doc Rivers, in your first year, it's championship or bust. <laughs> I'm sure Doc's really happy about that. And then you look at this. I understand that we dealt with Brooklyn, whether they were championship or bust. Nobody has ever said this about Philadelphia. They're two big guys are what, 24, 25 years old? They've never even been to a conference championship. So I don't know what Daryl Moore is talking about. Maybe he ought to say the following quote, if we don't win this year, I'll quit. Because nobody thinks that they have to win. Nobody. Right? Well, maybe this is a way of communicating with the players. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, this is something I can't wait to talk to Daryl about because there's too many good elements assembled there. Starting in the front office, Daryl Morey, the head coach, Doc Rivers, the two young stars, Embiid and Simmons. And that roster can be tinkered with a bit over the next sure. this season, sure. next season, probably the next season. Unless, Tony, there's some fracture between the stars. Now, there had reportedly been that before. Doesn't seem to be happening now. I like the Sixers. Look. I'm, I've picked the Sixers to win the East this year. I realize Brooklyn's made itself better. I realize Boston and Milwaukee are in the mix. Miami, when they get themselves together and get a little rest for Jimmy Butler. But I, I, I'm not running away from Philly, but they don't have to win this year. Quick question, and then we move on, okay? One word answer. You like the Lakers tonight or the Sixers tonight? I like the Sixers tonight. I know that... The the the, the Lakers are undefeated on the Six, road, it's fine. and they could sort of yeah. expand that and get into you know record all time territory. I'll I said one word, yes. one word. We're not Sixers, doing the filibuster yes. in the oh, Senate. Yes. Let's take a break. Coming up, what's the word for the beef that Russell Westbrook had with your boy John Wall last night? And should the five and ten Pelicans trade Lonzo Ball? What's the word is one word. I was sort of hoping you'd get in the mood because you'd give me one.
Time to have some words with Will Bond, and what's the word? What's first? Russell Westbrook and John Wall were blank last night. They were posturing. John Wall wanted to go out there, and he wanted to show everybody that he's as good as Russell Westbrook, who he was traded for, and he's not as good as Russell Westbrook. Russell, Russell Westbrook's a better player, but John Wall got the better of that last night, and then he got showy. At one point, he took the ball behind his back on a layup. He got very, very showy, and Westbrook, you know, started barking back after a while. Look, Wall beat Westbrook last night. He had 24 points. Westbrook had 19, and Wall's team won. Westbrook's on a bad team, and they're even worse when he's out there. They're 1-8 when shocking. he's on the floor, which yeah. is unbelievable to me because he's a great player. Uh, what, what impressed me, Mike, was how upset Wall was that Washington traded him. At the end of the game, he said, they watched me play. They thought I was done. They did. That has hurt him. They that did. That has hurt him, and that he's is right. true. They also got rid of him for Beal. They wanted Beal to be happy. They so, were both incomplete last night, Tony. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like Russ is in midseason form and you think he'll get there, but he, he, one in eight is nine games. That's all he's played. Yeah. The team had not played any games either. So they don't know how to react to each other. <laughs> Russell Westbrook's a great player, but it must be hard initially for guys to figure out how to play with him. And he's demanding. I mean, he, he's a demanding guy, and that speaks to a better future for the Wizards, future meaning next, the next few weeks. And then Wall, Tony, hasn't been in Houston that long. He's still getting used to those guys. Incomplete. I want to revisit this later, see how both of them are playing against others. Next. The Pelicans would be blank if they traded Lonzo Ball. They would be forgiven. They've tried. It isn't particularly working. He's not a good enough player to be in the position that he's in to run a team. He can't shoot. I used to think you could teach anybody to shoot. Maybe you can't teach everybody to shoot. He's, he, you can't give him 38 minutes if he doesn't score, Mike. He's shooting 39% from the field and 29% from three. He's afraid to drive and get fouled because he can't shoot foul shots. Look, Zion plays every game and they're five and 10. Maybe they weren't smart firing Alvin Gentry. Maybe at the moment, Stan Van Gundy isn't coach of the year. Maybe at the moment, David Griffin isn't GM of the year. But if you've got to move him because he's not the goods, I understand that. Well, he's not the goods. And I, I, I don't need to, like, go crazy because the Pelicans are 5-10. I mean, I, I, the Pelicans have growth room. I didn't have them making the playoffs this year. 5-10, and 10, maybe a little worse than I expected. Maybe I expected, I don't know, 7-8. and eight. But, Tony, the word you're looking for is net zero. I mean, I don't know that you can trade Lonzo Ball because he's been around long enough now. What is this, his fourth season? He's been around long enough now to, I think, make it so that you're not going to get a great player for him. And so how can you improve the team? So maybe this is a path for younger guards to come up and get some playing time, and that might be a really smart move. But net zero in terms of the short term, what are you going to get for Lonzo Ball at this point? Not, and it, not a whole hell of a lot. Didn't they trade Drew Holiday? Wasn't he a guy who could play that position? Yes, Drew Even Holiday words, played Will couple Bond. positions. <laughs> Let's yeah. take one last break, but still to come, will Tennessee's new coach turn around that program? And could Scotty Miller really beat Tyreek Hill in a race? Not in this lifetime. Do I need to say you it again? one guy as a cheetah, right? Yeah, yeah. One guy's Not happy 62nd birthday, Chris Collinsworth. Everyone knows him as the analyst in the booth next to Al Michaels on Sunday Night Football, the highest rated sports show. And Collinsworth's very good. Not everyone knows what a good athlete Collinsworth was. He was the Florida 3A sprint champion in high school. He went to UF as a running quarterback. Obviously, his speed and his 6'5 height worked in his favor when he converted to wide receiver, and he became an All-American. He was a second-round pick of the Bengals in 1981, and he made three Pro Bowls in his eight seasons there. Collinsworth played in two Super Bowls, losing both times to the 49ers. The second one was Super Bowl 23. The one the Bengals should have won, and almost won, until Joe Montana broke their hearts by finding John Taylor in the end zone with 34 seconds left. That was Collinsworth's final game. He left the NFL to go to law school and took a radio job to pay for it. Radio led to TV, and now he's in the booth with Uncle Big Al. Go figure. Tony, how many people who've ever played for the Cincinnati Bengals can say they were in two Super Bowls? Chris Collins worth can say that that's amazing seriously i mean you talk about six super bowls for brady how many how many super bowls have Bengals been to i would think two two common denominator I'm not sure chris collins you know.
Happy anniversary, Chuck. No, this is posthumous, but on this day 52 years ago, Noel was hired as head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers after Joe Paterno turned down the job. Noel was 37 at the time, then the youngest coach in the league. After a few years and some terrific drafts, the Steelers became the most powerful team in football. They won four Super Bowls in six years. Their defense was legendary, nicknamed the Steel Curtain. It featured Hall of Famers Jack Lambert, Mel Blunt, Mean Joe Green, and Jack Ham. The offense didn't have a nickname, but it had even more Hall of Famers. Terry Bradshaw, Lynn Swan, John Stallworth, Mike Webster, and Frank O'Harris. Noel was the 14th coach of the Steelers, and when he arrived, Pittsburgh was a doormat. In the 51 years since Noel took that job, the Steelers have had only three coaches, Noel, Bill Cower, Mike Tomlin, all of whom have won Super Bowls. Tony, when we had that conversation about greatest coaches of all time, Noel doesn't get nearly enough mention. I realized at the beginning of that you got Hallis and Lombardi and Shula, and then you have Walsh and Parcells and Gibbs, and you move on, and obviously you have, you have Belichick. But no, he doesn't get enough mention. Four Super Bowls in six years. It's amazing what they did in Pittsburgh during that stretch. Happy trails to Josh Heupel. The University of Tennessee, which last week hired Danny White away from the University of Central Florida to be their AD, has gone back to that well and hired Josh Heupel away from UCF to be their head football coach. Heupel, an All-American quarterback at Oklahoma, who led the Sooners to the BCS championship in 2000, was 28 and eight in three seasons coaching UCF, including an undefeated regular season in 2018. Heupel stresses offense. UCF averaged 43 points a game in 2018 and 19. At previous coaching stops as an assistant, Heupel recruited Jordan Love to Utah State, helped develop Drew Locke at Missouri, and coached Sam Bradford in his Heisman season at Oklahoma. Heupel takes over a Tennessee program that is under NCAA investigation. His hiring should put an end to Twitter reports that have Lane Kiffin going back to Knoxville. There was yet another depressing loss in the sports industry yesterday, Tom, when we learned that longtime respected NBA writer Sekou Smith died of COVID-related causes at the age of 48. Smith was like you and me, Tone, in that he started off writing at the Clarion Ledger and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Stan Van Gundy talked yesterday about how Smith was such a pro's pro. Most recently, Smith was working for Turner Sports, and you could see him and hear him on platforms like Hangtime. I was just on a Zoom eulogy with Smith and a few of our colleagues for sports writer Vaughn McClure in, I don't know, October? Still not over that. And now we have to deal with the passing of another dear friend and colleague, Sekou Smith. Rest in peace. Omissions today. Jason Witten is retiring again, and Candace Parker is leaving Los Angeles Sparks to join the Chicago Sky. Coming Let's home. go to the big finish. Let's do it. Bucks receiver Scotty Miller told Dan. Patrick, that he could beat Tyree Kill in a race. Are you buying that? You know, I always tell you I would never go to Vegas on whatever it is. I'd go to Vegas on this every day. Bruce Arian says, hell no, he won't retire. If the Bucks win the Super Bowl, you surprised at that? No, he's 68. He's only a kid as far as I'm concerned. No, if you, <laughs> if you, if you like what you're doing, why would you Keep retire? No, no. Devontae Smith says he and Tua have talked about possibly playing together 
on the Dolphins next season. Do you think that will happen? Doesn't matter what I think. Mel dropped his 1.0 mock draft. It ain't happening on Mel's board. That's gospel for me. Duke beat Georgia Tech to move to 6-5, and five, but Kentucky lost to Alabama and is an unthinkable 5-10. Your thoughts? So that's what, 11-16 and 16 combined or something like that? Man. The world is upside down. Duke and Kentucky, that, that can't happen. Last one, the Jazz beat the Knicks for their ninth straight win. Will they beat Dallas tonight for 10? Tony, I say yes, except Donovan Mitchell is out because of the 